again. Before we start, uh, just a few words, as you can see, uh, we're dedicating this wash talk to Professor Ron Droste. He passed away a few weeks ago, and uh, he was someone who was a trailblazer in many ways, not just in environmental engineering, but for me in particular, when I moved to Canada, he was one of the few people that were working in WASH already. So uh, a lot of what we're trying to do with WASH Canada does have a lot of uh, Ron's uh, fingerprints on. And so I think it would be very fitting for us to uh, acknowledge and, and remember his, his many legacies, but here we're just doing a, a dedication to him. So thank you everyone. Um, I will stop sharing, here we go. Okay, and uh, it's my great pleasure today uh, to have uh, Peter uh, join us. Peter has been joining us in the audience for quite a while now. Thanks, Peter, for the participation. And, and today, we're really glad to have you uh, stepping in. And uh, as you're just back from your assignment for the uh, the Gaza crisis, um, we're, we're really interested to hear uh, your perspectives on it. So um, I'll leave my intro to here and, and, and let you uh, take the floor. Thanks, Peter. All right, thank you. I will share my screen. Did that come up okay? Yeah. All right. Hello, I'm, I'm Peter. Uh, I just came back from working on the Gaza conflict. I was in um, Egypt, uh, in Cairo, as well as being in Gaza for a while. Um, I was there with Water Mission and World Central Kitchen and I'll just start off saying my views are my own and do not represent the views of either organization. So that's important one to go through. So my personal story, I studied at U of O um, since in, in the last seven years, I've been involved in 14 emergency disaster responses um, earthquakes, hurricanes, cyclones, epidemics, and conflicts. In the upper left, that was my living arrangements in Ukraine. I was living in a cardboard box. I had I had my bag and things and the shopping cart next to me. I was very thankful for that. It was very cold in the uh, parking lot where we were working. In the right, that's uh, me unloading a plane in Mozambique. You know, one of the aspects of disaster response is um, everyone works. I was the head of the WASH program, and the guy behind me is head of international communications, and we were both unloading the plane. Uh, below picture is Turkey. That is one of the tents we lived in. We had about 34 people living in tents like that and had four tents Um so I, I just want to say want, want you to know that I have um, done a lot of this work, and I can honestly say that I have not encountered a response that is as difficult as the one in Gaza right now. So the occupied Palestinian territory, um, so the Gaza Strip, most most disasters will affect hundreds of thousands of people. In the Bahamas, I was distributing uh, 300 meters cubed water per day to meet the needs of the people there. And here in Gaza, that would hardly scratch the surface. It would just meet a fraction of the needs here. Most disasters are one acute event, and then we can start a response. This one in Gaza is like a new disaster every day. The IDF are killing about 100 Palestinians per day. Approximately half of those are children. Uh, everything about this is, disaster is so complicated. The access, the transit, the communications, the logistics. One thing you'll hear a lot, uh, aid workers use a lot of TLAs, so three-letter acronyms. I'll try and remember to um, explain some of these as I'm going along. So IDF is the Israeli Defense Force. Here is a map of Gaza. So Gaza has about the same population as Toronto in about half the land area. This 
is a damage assessment um, from the Copernicus Sentinel satellite system. It shows uh, buildings that are damaged to every little red spot. This is an amazing tool. I first used it in Morocco for the earthquakes. We could compare satellite data and see uh, the villages that were affected. Um, I'll, I'll go over this a bit. Here's the north, usually just referred to as north or the north Gaza. It's cut off at the Wadi Gaza Kuwaiti junction is over here and beyond that is difficult to get aid in. It's, they're not letting people south, they're not letting any aid north. Um, there's about 300,000 people left in that area. Then we've got Deir al-Bala, kind of the middle. Um, we're, we actually just call it middle, middle Gaza. Khan Yunus, IDF have just finished operations in Khan Yunus and are now looking at Rafa, which is scaring every aid worker. Um, it's going to make things more complicated. Rafa initially had a population of 242,000 right now with the IDPs, internally displaced peoples. There is over 1.5 million in a very small area here. Right here is the Philadelphia corridor. When I was there, it used to be just sand, sand lot. When I was there, there's maybe 50,000 tents and shelters. Uh, the Al Mawasi humanitarian zone right here along the the coast uh, shelters are also popping up. It's supposed to be a safe zone, but as you can see from the damage assessment, uh, buildings are still being destroyed there. There's a there's a, a common uh, saying in Gaza that nowhere is safe, and it, it's quite true. These are flyers that are put out by the Israeli Defense Force. They'll drop these by air into an area. Um, these ones were from Khan Yunus telling people to move into, into um, safe areas. The, the huge irony is having a QR code on there. Um, Gaza is usually within a communications blackout at any given time. So using a QR code is uh, useless since there's no power for phones and there is uh, no internet, internet communication. So it's very ironic. Um, right here, there, there's an interesting line here. Your fate, this is a rough Google Lens translation of, of one of the flyers. Uh, your fate and the fate of your family is decided by you alone. That is not entirely true. Um, again, that common saying, nowhere is safe. Um, people in Gaza, they don't trust the IDF. They don't trust Hamas. Neither one of them have their best interests in mind, and they are caught between. There's 2.2 million people caught in this conflict. Um, I was in Rafah. Uh, conditions at night were interesting. Um, the drones are constant. You, We can't see them, but just there's this underlying drone um, you can hear anywhere. Our, our buildings were would shake from the munitions being used all around us. I remember waking up at 3.30 one time. It felt like um, an earthquake, about four or five on the Richter scale. And it's like, okay, our windows are still intact, so we're all right. And then 5.30, it happened again, shook just as much. And at that point, I got on, put on my pants, and then went back to bed um, just, so, just so in case something came closer, I'd be more ready to uh, run. So I'll, I'll go over a bit of the humanitarian actions that I was a part of. So World Central Kitchen and, and Water Mission. World Central Kitchen is an amazing organization. They are taking on a lot of the burden of feeding the population of Gaza. They have one main kitchen in Rafa that's putting out about 50,000 meals. There are existing community kitchens that they're supporting by sending in uh, pots and pans and raw food. Uh, to enable them to take care of communities around them. They're also doing RTE meal kit distributions, so ready to eat or MREs. Um, on February 18th, this is the latest data I had from them, but they distributed 30.9 million meals, and that is immense. It's huge. And considering there's 2.2 million people in Gaza, 
and there's been 138 days of conflict that is barely scraping the surface of the need there. So I was also working with Water Mission. I was taking on their w WCK support um, aspect, their program. Uh, they were also doing other things. So Water Mission is an engineering NGO specializing in wash, which means it's very close to my heart. They are partnering with organizations inside Gaza, um, doing procurement in Cairo or Gaza. Um, they were working on reverse osmosis systems. So we were using mostly brackish water systems there. They're doing design and the manufacture and then facilitating delivery. Also, latrine programs, again, design and manufacture in Cairo and Gaza and um, facilitating delivery. Right here, we've got a picture of some of our installed latrines. They're very basic. We had to use, these were made inside Gaza. We had to use what was available. You see, uh, we have piped water, uh, just so the toilets are flushable, and then sewer lines here that connected to a main sewer line. We were not the only ones. Uh, currently, there are 27 organizations working on WASH in Gaza. So 21 INGOs, one regional NGO, one local NGO, well, four, four local NGOs, and then three UN agencies that all have uh, a hand in working there. So I will go over some of the uh, challenges. Every response I've been on has had its unique situations and challenges. And again, this response is the most difficult I have ever been a part of. Some common challenges that go across every cluster, every aspect of it. One, the population density, population desperation, uh, communications, logistics, and it's an active war zone. So stuff happens. Here we see on the right where the IDP centers are. Um, there are 24 public schools that are being used as shelters. These schools were designed for, there's one that was designed for 624 people and now has about 15,000 people living in it. Um, there's the UNRWA shelters, um, then many informal shelters, just because there's so much need, people just gather into a shelter and make it work. The population is very mobile. People have this, been displaced about five, six times already. Uh, so multiple times. Rafa has now taken most of the population of Gaza, so 1.5 million people in Rafa. Um, UNRWA, you might have heard them in the news, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees. It comes out that seven other people might have been involved in the October 7th attack on Israel. Uh, yeah, it could. it's possible. Um, also, it's possible that it's not. The Israelis have not brought forward proof of this. They, they've given it over, but the... It, so far, they're just allegations. So I was uh, shocked and kind of ashamed when I saw that Canada was one of the first countries to defund UNRWA. Um, the, the next day, they actually started funding uh, other UN agencies, just shifted funds. But again, this is so damaging. UNRWA is, has 155 shelters, and they are one of the backbones of providing aid in Gaza. Um, you can see they have more than a million people in their camps that they are taking care of. So defunding UNRWA is devastating to the people. Also, UNRWA is very political based. They are one of the only things that are maintaining refugee status for Palestinians. So if a Palestinian leaves Gaza, they can come back because UNRWA allows re-entry and keeps that um, keeps that refugee status for them. If UNRWA is suddenly dissolved and shifted, it's going to make a huge problem for the people there. Here's a video of what we started calling a self-distribution. People have very little, they're very hungry 
it is very difficult to distribute aid. The roads work at a donkey pace, um, just because this is almost, this is how crowded roads normally look. People walking down them all the time. It's so hard to move. And if you've got one donkey on the road, all your trucks are moving at a donkey pace. We had uh, unofficial police checkpoints that would stall a convoy and then there'd be people waiting on the side to jump in the trucks and take the items. It's possible that some of this aid is getting to Hamas, but most of it is still doing its work and getting to the people. This population has been caged in Gaza for decades. It's been very difficult for people to come in and out and they have become very adept at recycling. You'll notice that everything is taken off the truck. Uh, the tarps are taken, the uh, plastic is taken, the pallets are taken, uh, everything is used. Uh, one of the odd things that we saw in all of these distributions that it was always a fight to get something off the truck, but then someone could grab it and stick their box on the ground and it was untouchable. It, people would not touch a box on the ground. And so it was quite safe and they'd go back on the truck and grab something else. But the box on the ground was uh, totally safe. So it was uh, interesting. One of my most common sayings on a disaster is it's not ideal, but this is not an ideal way of distributing food aid or any kind of aid, but it still, a, still accomplishes a purpose. Because of distributions like this, the market price of food has dropped to back to pre-war levels. So we are still accomplishing the goal of making food available to people, making goods available to people. Uh, we, we eventually started adapting to this. Transport trucks would leave at, shh, my cat's visiting, shh. Transport trucks would have to leave at night, start at uh, 3.30 in the morning. When that became untenable, um, then we started using unlabeled box trucks to move goods around, which puts more of a risk on the drivers um, because they could be more targeted. There's less security, but just the anonymity allowed us to move things. Communications were always a major problem. Most responses, uh, there's protocols when workers fall out of communication. In this one, it was normal to lose communication for three or 14 days or so, some of my workers would have to walk four hours to be able to call in to make a report. In the the wash workers I had, they were excellent. I could trust them to operate on their own initiative. I could give them priorities. And then if I don't see them for several days, then they could work at their own pace and their own discretion. At the kitchen one day, we had two workers just not show up for work. Uh, it turned out when we found out the next day, they were pulling their families out of um, the building. Their most families, an entire extended family will live together because they've been displaced so many times. So you might have many people in a single apartment. So one of the workers, they had 16 family members dying and the other one had 24 just in that single night. Um, and this this is um, th this is common. They were back to work the next day because these people are very resilient. Um, I'm I'm amazed at the Palestinians. They're so giving um, their their desperation, but they're very hospitable still. Logistics uh, was a nightmare. Um, most. Most aid groups are stationed in Cairo because it's what's available. It's the best spot for procurement and the Rafa border is the best area to get spots in. But uh, you have to go through the Sinai Peninsula to do that. So normal trip when I went from Cairo to Gaza border is about six hours. You still stop through about 10 military checkpoints uh, along the road, go from Cairo up here, Go from uh, Cairo up here and across this road, Al Arish is right here, and then you can enter Gaza right here. Uh, Sinai is a peacekeeping zone. There's a whole history on that. You can look online for it later, uh, but it complicates things. So trucks are scanned at the Suez Canal. 
uh, and then again at the Rafa border. And so it takes about two weeks for a truck to get up here. Alarish is used as a layover point, but from what I know, it's filled to capacity. There's so many trucks there. Uh, there are two main entry points into Gaza. The Rafa crossing is down here and then Karem Shalom. Pallets must be size 120 by 120 by 130 centimeters with a max weight of 75 kilos and be wrapped four times in plastic wrap and secured with plastic binding to be able to get in. They need to be taken down, put through a scanner and put back on the truck. So it's very slow. Uh, Karem Shalom um, opening, the crossing was open because of limitations with the Gaza crossing, but it has its own complications. All all um, items entering must conform to the dual use list that is uh, put out. It's very limiting, and we'll talk about that very quickly. Um, so exceptions can be requested from COGENT, which is the Coordination of Government Activities in the Territories. It might take about a month to get permission, and even if you do get permission to bring something in, it's still no guarantee that they will pass the border. And I've had that happen several times with RO systems. The dual use list. This is just a short example of some of the items on the list. Some items make absolute sense. For chloride salts, nitric acid, mercury, all, all these things can be used in explosives. Some things complicate things like communications equipment, metal pipes, aluminum rods. The Red Cross was having trouble getting tents in because they, the rods were not permitted, which made shelter difficult. Some things are devastating. Water disinfection materials are not permitted above a concentration of 11%. One thing that was interesting, they don't say 11% of what. Um, I'm assuming chlorine, but it was never specifically stated. Um, equipment for physical or chemical analysis made things difficult as well. And again, Portland cement, asphalt, all foundation materials. These are things that are desperately needed to start rebuilding uh, Gaza again but they're also possibly used in tunnel manufacturing. So it could be risky to bring these things in. I brought in um, a suitcase of repair materials for an RO system. Uh, some way, the only thing, only way to do that is just by person. I carried several suitcases with me into Gaza. It caused uh, many hours of delay at the Gaza border. Uh, the Egyptian bomb squad didn't know what they were. And then we had to wait for Egyptian intelligence to clear. And then again, there's another delay on the Palestinian side um, when they were questioning every piece that was in that suitcase. But that one suitcase I brought in uh, had enough repair materials in it to bring a thousand cube system uh, back to full functionality. So that was a huge impact on water production in Gaza. Here is the logistics of the trucking at the border. So normally pre-war times, 500 truckloads would pass through, um, pass into Gaza. It's so not the case now. On the left, you see the daily average by week. And then on the right is the last last uh, 10 days of information or so, so the daily total. You can see we're not getting anywhere close to 500 trucks per day, sometimes as little as four, seven, or zero. And this is devastating. It's desperately needed. There's not enough food. There's not enough fuel. It, it's difficult. This is driving up to the Rafa crossing. There are hundreds of trucks lined up for many kilometers uh, waiting to cross into Rafa. And this doesn't even include um, Alarish. So all the trucks that are waiting there and lay over. Here's Karem Shalom crossing. It has its own complications. So the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, um, forced Israel to open up another entry but it kept getting shut down by protesters. Um, Israelis didn't want aid going into Gaza. So the Israelis declared it a um, protected military zone again after 
the ICJ pushed them a little, and this is still happening, even though it's a protected military zone. So Karim Shalom has its own complications. And then movement inside Gaza is very difficult again. This is a truck that was on a food aid convoy moving through the Al Mawasi humanitarian zone. The convoy most likely had UN armored vehicles on either end, and it was fired on with heavy caliber rounds from IDF naval forces. So even if we can get food in there, there's such a severe lack of security for humanitarian efforts. It's so difficult. Uh, the UN actually stopped food aid convoys after this. This was on February 5th, but that's what a 20 millimeter shell does to um, a truck full of food. Uh, movement within Gaza is severely limited. It is unsafe for civilians and aid workers. Um, the truck drivers have started refusing to drive uh, some places. It, it's difficult. So for the wash challenges, so many things are, again, difficult. This is a, a small picture of the Philadelphia corridor. Um, this is when I was driving through it. This is a very small, small section of it. There's kilometers of tents like this. But wash challenges are groundwater conditions, water quantity and quality, power requirements, water availability, sanitation. Hygiene is becoming a major problem. There's a major hepatitis A outbreak. Um, there are about 300,000 uh, cases of diarrheal disease in IDP centers. More than half of that is in children under five. This is only what is seen by uh, MSF or other organizations. So there's much more that is not diagnosed. Groundwater quality is terrible. There's a lot of pollution from agriculture, the exfiltration sewage systems where uh, it's a lagoon that just drains into the ground. There's a it's a very dense urban environment and an active conflict zone, so we don't know what is being washed into the ground from broken buildings to munitions. There are so many unknowns, and again, with we have no capacity to test for these things since that kind of equipment is not permitted. And this is from a paper uh, showing groundwater quality deterioration from 2009 and 20 to 14. It's such a dense population and it's very close to the sea. So overuse of the wells has caused uh, saltwater intrusion, which is making the groundwater difficult to drink and it must be treated by RO systems or reverse osmosis to get the salt out. You can see the degradation from 2009 to 2014. Now fast forward 10 years and you can understand um, the impact and why RO is necessary. The water quantity, Israel used to have three uh, water pipelines. So the Mekaron pipelines uh, going into Gaza where most of the supply was. Only one of those lines is working now in that 47% capacity. There are only two of three uh, water desalination plants are running and not at full capacity, none of them. There, there are two main desalination companies that I worked with, uh, Ada. Uh, we got a lot of our supplies for RO systems from them. Uh, at the start of the war, their warehouse was destroyed and they have very little material to continue working. CMW used the coastal municipality's water utility. They run some um, rather large desalination systems, and they had capacity for water trucking. In January, their warehouse was also hit. One of the sad things is because people have been displaced so many times, the uh, they had their families inside the warehouse when it was hit. So we lost contact with them for about three, four days while they were trying to move their family uh, out. And many family members were died or injured out of that. So it was a big blow to them. Groundwater wells is one of the other sources of water, but only 17% of the groundwater wells are in operation. 
39 have been destroyed, 93 severely and moderately damaged, and they're, they're very deep. And so it takes a lot of energy. The submersible pumps are three to seven horsepower, which take a lot of energy just to get the water to the surface where it can again be treated by something very um, energy intensive. So deep wells, reverse osmosis is the only way to treat groundwater and also so power intensive. Also, we use UV disinfection, which again takes power because chlorine was rare and very difficult to get in. Right there on the left, you see I have 20 RO systems that were custom made to get through uh, COGAT. Um, they were adapted to um, uh, comply with COGAT, uh, the dual use list. And they were, uh, they were made to work with solar panels or off generators. COGAT initially approved the solar panels, but then they've been de uh, delayed uh, for about three months or so, and we still don't have permission to get them in. So those systems are sitting in a warehouse with no power, uh, waiting for some kind of solution. On the right is one of the systems Water Mission was making for Oxfam. This is a containerized RO system. The container helps with security. Um, for people and uh, nearby explosions are problematic. These ones are made for solar and generator. They come with a generator. It took several months just to get permission for those generators. Uh, we finally got permission for that, but once they go in, there's so little fuel to actually run these generators. So it's kind of a crapshoot to see if they'll be useful. Again, sanitation is a major problem. There's no solid waste collection, so it's being pushed to the side and just existing there. Sewage waste, with with, um, with these IDP centers being so overcrowded, there's not enough latrines. At uh, one point, I saw that there was one toilet for 500 people at one shelter, and that is pretty common. The infrastructure is broken. The wastewater treatment systems are there, the big municipal ones, but they haven't been in operation since the start of the war because there's no power for uh, to run them. Uh, there's no fuel for the generators to get them going, so they are just sitting there. And any repair takes construction materials, which are incredibly limited and difficult to get across the border. Health challenges, just about every hospital in Gaza has been hit. So 29 of 36 hospitals have taken damage. You can see on the bottom is the, I couldn't blow it up very well, but it's the timeline of hospital functionality in Gaza since the October 7th. So I had October 7th, they're close to 100%. Right now their capacity is below 47%. And that is at a time when you're seeing about 100 deaths per day and there's 69,000 people who have been injured. So the need has gone up and the capacity has gone down. These places are overwhelmed. And here is an update from OCHA showing some of the impact. I thought I'd cut and paste this in. Food security is an immense problem. Uh, OCHA is the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. They are usually the ones who coordinate information movement across all the clusters uh, in a disaster. Water and sanitation, we've gone over some of these. Health, we've gone over these problems. Education, at this point, is something that I know UNICEF is looking at, but there's such other massive needs. I know the kids need ed education, but it's so, so far down the scale for me. One thing to note is the humanitarian operations. So far, 160 UN staff have been killed. That is the highest the UN has ever taken in any operation. So this is off the scale for them as well. The WASH cluster and health cluster got together to put out an advocacy note. This is a call for action on measures that are required immediately. This was published on February 9th. What is needed is an immediate and sustained ceasefire. Safe unimpeded at scale humanitarian access across and within the Gaza Strip, including the North. Right now, the, the North is isolated. There's 300,000 people there who are not getting food. Uh, what I have heard is that people are starting to die there. 
their last resort was uh, grinding up animal feed and making bread out of that. And sounds like that is now um, being used up as well. Ensure free and safe movement of medical and humanitarian personnel. You can see that even when we had a UN aid convoy, it was still attacked. It's so hard to move. Immediate turn to full capacity, the Mekra water pipeline into the north. The north is inaccessible. They desperately need food and water. Allow entry to temporary latrine and shower facilities. Right now, these are being held up at the border by the IDF. Allow sufficient fuel for the operation of critical water and sanitation infrastructure. Again, these are being held up at the border by IDF. This is a quote from uh, Euromed, Euromed uh, article. So the International Court of Justice in January 26th had a ruling on South Africa's uh, request uh, uh, on, on the genocide in the Gaza Strip is what they were calling. So they, they made a ruling on January 26th that Israel must do all it can to prevent death, destruction, and any acts of genocide in Gaza and punish anyone who advocates or participates in such activities. And to quote from Euromed, the Israeli army is still systematically destroying residential neighborhoods, civilian infrastructure, and other facilities, rendering most of the Gaza Strip de facto uninhabitable. During the period since the ICJ ruling, the Israeli army blew up at least 43 residential squares, each square containing between 20 to 50 houses, mainly in Khan Yunus and the southern Gaza Strip and continued to bomb and destroy houses even after its military operations in the southern Gaza Strip were terminated a few weeks ago. So one of the problems right now is, is the huge fear of aid organizations is that uh, the IDF are finishing up in Khan Yunus and the next place to go is Rafa. Right now, um, all the infrastructure that has been created in Rafa to help the people there will be rendered moot. Um, the people in Al Mawasi uh, and the Philadelphia corridor may have to move north into areas that have been systematically destroyed. And just like in the slide above, that there's nothing left to go into. And it'll be again, another displacement, which the UN doesn't want to be a part of. If this happens, the Rafa border crossing and Karem Shalom may not be useful anymore. There's just so many problems. There's 1.5 million people squeezed into Rafa, and now they have to move, possibly. So this is what we're all waiting for, the next step. Uh, the ICJ, um, International Court of Justice, made a release on February 16th. The court notes that the most recent developments in the Gaza Strip and in Rafa in particular would exponentially increase what is already a humanitarian nightmare with untold regional consequences. So this is this is uh, a big thing and it's the next possibility. So thank you for listening with me for that long. Um, Gaetano, I'll throw it over to you.